Cool. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Isaiah Sarju. I will be talking about threat modeling. Online dating is just the thing to get you into the room, but my focus today is going to get you the basics for, uh, to, to be able to start doing threat modeling in your day to day. So I'm going to start with kind of a background of why I chose online dating. Then we're going to talk about some of the core steps you need to get started doing threat modeling. And then we're going to wrap it up and talk about why I, I love this so much. So let's do it. Okay. Boom. And clicker, please work. Oh, there it goes. Just a little delay. Okay. So you know my name. Uh, I do red teaming. I've taught information security. I, I am, the reason why I speak is because I'm anti-nihilism, anti-security theater, and anti-wasted time. But I prefer to frame it in a more positive way, and I'm pro-risk-based security. So what that means is that I believe that risk can be identified, I believe it can be measured, and then I, can, I believe it can be dealt with. Uh, I think there's often a sense in our industry that the sky is always falling, and there's nothing we can do about it. I want to fight against those nihilistic tendencies and say, yes, we, we can handle this risk and we can make our users and our applications and our environment safer. Um, as an aside, I always like to tell people what I love. I love chocolate chip cookies. Um, and so if you really enjoy the talk, feel free to buy me a chocolate chip cookie. Uh, if you don't like the talk and you see me eating one, you can just slap it out of my hand and that way I'll know that you really didn't like my talk. So, okay, boom, and boom, there we go. Okay, that might happen a few times, I'll just keep it going. Okay, so who this talk is for. Uh, it's for folks who want to learn what threat modeling is, um, understand the basics of, of threat modeling, um, be able to apply threat modeling to the development stages of building a new application or a new platform, and then learn tips for doing online dating. And when I say that, I mean to do it more safely and securely. I would not take recommendations from me for how to be better at online dating. Um, that would probably not help your chances. So some things that you're going to walk away with today are you're going to understand the basics of DFDs or data flow diagrams, stride and using that against DFDs, attack trees, which I love, um, and then the principles of nimity and linkability, which are important when building uh, social apps that display or don't display certain types of personal information. Okay, so why online dating? Uh, besides the fact that it's fun to talk about, it's a hot topic. So we, we all know about the, uh, you know, it's growing in popularity, you know, more, more and more people are meeting, uh, you know, long-term partners or partners through online dating, but what really got me is just when I, I Googled dating software. And this was Google's recommendations of things I might be interested in. Of course, there's Tinder, Grindr, Bumble, but then you also see PostNuke and MySQL. And so our love lives are literally getting turned into content management systems and databases. And so regardless of your view on online dating, whether it's the best thing or the worst thing ever, there's no denying that it is tightly integrated with technology, and technology is linked with the future of humanity. So uh, not, not making a statement about whether it's good or bad, but simply saying it is an important thing to think about. Think. There we go. So uh, I think that there has to be a reason that we do security. It can't exist in a vacuum. Uh, I want to avoid nihilism. I want to promote safe and positive interactions. And I really want applications to be more privacy and security aware. Uh, too many applications are just focusing on how do I monetize this? How do I you know, just turn over, maybe go to IPO, whatever it might be, but not thinking about the users and the effects that the technology has. And I don't believe that we should ever just do security for security's sake. You know, it's a lot of fun to, to point fingers and laugh and say, oh, you got it wrong or to just go through all these exercises because our minds enjoy that, that process of thinking, you know, kind of uh, deviantly and how bad things can happen. But in the end, none of this stuff matters if we aren't doing it for a positive purpose. And there are so many folks who do not feel safe engaging in online dating and other social media platforms because of 
their gender identity, because of their lifestyle choices, because of, uh, of, their, of their religion or whatever it might be um, that prevents them from engaging because they don't feel safe and protected on these platforms. And so I hope that as technology continues to integrate more into our lives, that we continue to build applications that are more accessible to everybody involved. Otherwise, this stuff doesn't matter. So that's one of the reasons why I talk and one of the reasons why I, I care about these things. There we go. So, what happens when you don't do threat modeling? <laughs> there are many bad things that happen, uh, but I'm gonna talk about two specific ones. Uh, the check marks research with Tinder matching disclosure, and then data, data linking disclosure, which is an example I, I created myself to demonstrate this principle. Let me see if I can move this thing so that it picks it up better. Cool, okay, here we go. So, like I said, the first thing we're gonna learn about is DFDs, or data flow diagrams. Okay, so, I want you to keep this in your mind. You, I'm, I'm gonna explain it. This is a quick DFD I created for uh, a hypothetical online gating application. Keep it in your mind um, as we describe it, and then we'll kind of review it again. So you'll see this a couple times throughout the presentation if you didn't have time to grab your picture right now. Here we go. So the purpose of, uh, the purpose of it is to understand how data flows throughout an environment. Adam Shostak, who literally wrote one of the books on, uh, on uh, threat modeling after Windows Snyder, um, it says that problems tend to follow the data flow, not the control flow. So we have to think about how data is moving throughout our environment into and then out of, and that's where a lot of the problems can happen. And then we can apply stride to each step of the way. So going back, thinking about, okay, we see how data flows in and out. You know, let's break this down a little bit. So we understand that we as the end user interact with the dating application. Um, we might be using something like federated authentication. Uh, so Facebook or Google, whatever it might be to be logging in. So that's our social media down there for that federated. Could be pulling in, you know, uh, you know, gender, um, age, name, pictures, all of that's coming from a, from a social media third party. Um, that's getting put into the system. We're also sending data that we can edit from our app client or our web client. Then there's some type of matching process that links you with conversations, and that's all presented to us through a front end. And, you know, we know that... Uh, that all these applications want to monetize every last bit of information. So inevitably, we have that user data going out to third-party data purchasers. And you know, one thing I'll mention is it doesn't always happen exactly like this. Sometimes it's coming straight from that end user. And that's how folks were able to identify things like um, Grindr disclosing HIV statuses to third parties, was because it was coming straight out of that application. So it doesn't always happen like this, but this is kind of a general one that I, I created. Key things are you divide it into context, and then you want to start looking. You want to start applying stride, which we'll talk about in a second, to the points where data is crossing context. That's where you're going to have the most problems and the most bang for your buck when you're doing something like threat modeling. So start looking at when data crosses context, and that'll make sense here in a second. Cool. So, what is Stride? Um, it, is a, it is a mnemonic or acronym. I always forget the, how to use those words correctly. Um, I do security, not, not, not English. Um, so, you have spoofing, which is falsely claiming to be Isaiah Sarju on Tinder. Again, I do not recommend you do that. It would greatly lower your chances of success. Um, then there's, uh, there's tampering, you know, maybe changing the profile photo that's presented or Somebody swipes left, changing that to a right swipe. Um, uh, repudiation. Uh, if someone is able to say, I didn't do this action, and you can't prove they did that one way or the other, um, then you don't have non-repudiation, which that's, a, that's probably the most confusing one um, that, that folks get hung up on. Information disclosure. So disclosing um, somebody's swipe decision, disclosing their, their matches, their chats, 
or disclosing information that maybe they're even on the dating app outside of their geographical location that they've chose to kind of fence off to who they show. Maybe they live in a different area than their parents do, and their parents would be devastated if they found out they were on this, this app. So um, making sure that that information is not being disclosed to unauthorized parties. Denial of service, you know, if it's uh, in the U.S., if it's a Friday or Saturday night, or here if it's a Thursday or a Friday night, um, you know, if your application isn't available, you know, that might mess up some people's evening plans. Um, and so not, they might go to a, a different application. And then you have elevation of privilege. So being able, so people think of elevation of privilege, they often only think vertically. Like I went from regular user to admin. But there's also this, this lateral movement, which is something that's often overlooked. Um, so maybe being able to see profiles before the algorithm has deemed um, that it is your time to see such said profile. Uh, and this is something that demonstrates even how bad I still am at threat modeling, is when I thought about elevation of privileges, I was like, oh no, that, that doesn't really happen in dating apps. I can't really see that. I haven't seen any research on that. But then, who can tell me, or does somebody tell me, where is authentication usually happening? Just shout it out. Authentication often happens from where? Yeah, it happens at the beginning. Uh, let's say it's federated. What is the common platform that it's being federated? Facebook. Yeah, so that social media right there. So until, you know, the, the vulnerability last year in Facebook where people could do the view as and then move that and then move from that to then authenticate to the applications that folks were using through that federated authentication. I hadn't thought about elevation of privilege, but it's so clear. If I had just applied stride there, I could go, well, wait, what if somebody was able to compromise that third party or be able to compromise somebody else's um, social media profile? Is, are we thinking about elevation of privilege? So there's always more you can do. Even myself, who I do this on a weekly or monthly basis and coach other folks through it, I still miss things. So it's never perfect, and that's not the goal, but it's to, it's to think about it. So let's talk about the, the, the check marks research that happened a couple years ago. Um, so like I said, you want to start when data changes context. Uh, and this is happening between the change of context between the end user and the, the front end or the, the application context over there. So what they were able to find is that uh, the images that were being presented to folks were being sent uh, in, in, um, in clear text. And so if you're on the same broadcast domain, let's say you're at a coffee shop sitting on that network, you could see who folks were swiping on. Uh, however, the decision of being right, right swipe, left swipe, or a match were encrypted, but they provided different si data sizes. And so you could identify if it was a right swipe, a uh, left swipe, or a match. Matches had, had the largest return data um, from, uh, from, from Tinder's IP address space. And so they were able to see how folks were matching. And so this is a, a good example of that, that information disclosure that I was talking about. And that was happening here between the end user and the application. That's when that data was changing context. So, you know, we're kind of like, oh my God, people can see who they're matching with, that's bad. Like I said, let's focus on the positive because there always is a way to manage this risk. And so let's manage it. So, for those of you who do risk management, these are, this is kind of, you know, the basic things you learn on, on day zero. Uh, for those of you who are kind of new to risk management, these are the main ways you can handle it accept the risk, uh, you can avoid it, you know, just be like, oh, I'm not going to online date. Um, you can transfer that risk. Uh, a good example of risk transference is, let's say, in the physical security sense, instead of your company doing the physical security itself, you hire guards. So that risk has been transferred or maybe buying insurance, breach insurance. And then you can mitigate or reduce. Some folks divide those two separately, but I believe that you can mitigate partially or you can mitigate fully. So I see it more as a, as a gradient um, of that mitigation slash reduction. 
So let's apply some of these things to the checks marks problems. So an important thing for me is that when we talk about how do we protect users is we're not just putting all of the responsibility on the app developer or on the end user. The app developers want to say it's on the end user and the end user goes, why did the app developers create something that I don't feel safe using? So I, I like to approach things from both sides of that coin. Um, so from the app developers, they could use HTTPS. Um, I'm not going to belabor this point. Just do it. Like it's 2019. Secure your channels. Uh, okay, that's the last time I'll talk about that. That's, I, I get annoyed slightly every time I have to bring that up. But that's just something folks should be doing. Um, you can standardize the response size. That's a, a way of mitigating that information disclosure of yes, no. Um, on the user side, you could do things like uh, use a VPN. So you're mitigating that risk uh, if you're in a, in a public area. Or you could avoid the risk by just by only swiping at home. <coughs> So let's now hop over and talk about attack trees and nimity slash linkability. So I love attack trees. I use them a lot in my red teaming activity. Uh, we recently had to do a physical breach, and we were told, uh, just uh, break into the building. I was like, that's not an objective. Just break into the building. Like, yeah, I'll just tailgate somebody. Done. Like, there has to be some risk that I'm actually providing to the organization. So we sat down and I asked the stakeholders, like, what would be bad at this location? And like, oh, well, we developed, sor we have some of our, our source code here. Okay, so being able to potentially extract source code from a system, take pictures of uh, p things on whiteboards for new applications that are being developed, whatever it might be. So then I start to have these objectives. And one thing that can kind of confuse folks when they start out with attack trees is you actually start with your objective and then you identify all the different ways of reaching that objective. Uh, so let's say I do not want to be stalked by somebody. And most people don't want to be stalked. So I want to think uh, maliciously, like I was the user, like I was the, the evil doer trying to stalk me. So their goal could be to stalk, to stalk me, and they have all these sub-goals that could help them get to that. Um, maybe they want to know where, where I live. So you know, we match on Tinder, and they go, oh, I really like your profile. What's your home address? Um, like, that probably won't get them very far. But uh, that's one way they could do that. Um, and then what I want to focus on is identifying where, where people potentially work. Um, so if we look at the goal of to stalk someone, to learn where they work, um, you could see maybe they put it straight there in their profile. They say, I work at this place. Or again, they could be like, they could match with me, be like, oh, I really like your profile. Where do you work? <laughs> and so, you know, probably also wouldn't get very far. But then this idea of nimity and linkability come in, where you can take bits of partially disclosed information and you can put them together to, to, to learn your objective. Um, so maybe they disclose their profession, uh, maybe they disclose their real name, and you have an idea of the general location they're in based on where you're swiping. And so then using data linkage, you can identify where they actually work. So we'll go into this, because these are important concepts for privacy concerned apps. So nimity is the amount of information uh, about the identity of the participant that is revealed in a, in a given interaction. And then the linkability is the, is the ability to bring together these disparate records um, based on some shared information and create what I call a virtual join. Um, there are other names for it, or just like a linked, uh, a linked database. And so you see this in data breaches. If in one data breach, somebody's uh, name and social security number is disclosed, and in another breach, their social security and their home address is disclosed, and in another one, their home address and their relationship status is disclosed. You can link all of those together based on the shared keys across, the, across those different uh, groups of data and you now have a, a virtual or a super record of this person. So this is a real person um, uh, on an online dating application and all they said was, uh, so if you, you can barely read it, but they said that they did some type of work at some tech company, at some tech. So they realized, they said, I don't want to disclose where I actually work. They, were, they, they knew that, they understood that, 
they said, I don't want to say exactly where I work because there is a risk um, in this world uh, of people being malicious and not understanding boundaries. So, but with just that, I was able to find their LinkedIn and with information on their LinkedIn, I was able to find their Instagram and on their Instagram, based on pictures they had, uh, able to identify the, very, the area where they live. So a lot of information just from the person's real name and the identity uh, and, and some describing information about where the type of work that they do. Um, folks have asked me, why do I blur out so much on here? Because this is a real person and in security research, disclosure does not equal consent. This person chose to disclose their tender to a specific group of people in a specific geographic location. They did not consent to have their picture and their LinkedIn put up at a conference in, in Tel Aviv. So when doing research, you know, some of the research I reviewed while doing this, you know, just was flagrant with the data they, they put out. They just put out people's names. They, they're like, well, they did it, so it's okay. It's like, no, it's not okay. They disclosed it to a group of people with a specific context uh, and, pur and purpose of use. So that's my little soapbox that I always use whenever I have a soapbox or a podium is it's important when you're doing security research to, to understand that you're dealing with real lives and real people. Um, so yeah, so again, this is kind of scary stuff. We're sufficiently depressed, but there's always hope we can manage this risk. Cool. So. You know, from the application side, you could allow users to choose which information they disclose, whether that's their real name or, uh, you know, things like that. And so that's transferring that risk. Um, as the end user, you could just not date, you know, they just avoid that risk. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that dating outside of online dating is any safer, um, especially for, for various groups of folks in this world. but. It, it, that is one option if you specifically haven't found a way to handle the risk in a way that you find appropriate for, the, for online dating. Um, this is an interesting one, the, in, the use of Instagram. So it used to be that Tinder would disclose the full Instagram handle. And so folks could, if you were looking at somebody's profile, you could find their actual Instagram and on Bumble, you couldn't, they just showed you know, a limited set of pictures based on some time period that they pulled from Instagram. But what you could do with Tinder is you could find somebody's real Instagram and you could go harass them. And so I'm guessing that, so the first time I gave this talk was at DerbyCon and since then, Tinder now does not disclose their Instagram handle. I don't believe I had any, any actual, you know, I don't think somebody from Tinder came to my talk and was like, oh my goodness, we just realized this. There's probably thousands of users being like, can I please stop getting harassed? Um, and so I'm just one small voice in a, in a group of people that want to advocate for privacy and safety uh, in, social, in social applications. So that was, that's an interesting kind of change that I've seen over the last year of them becoming more cognizant of that. You can do things like fuzzy or delayed location. Um, so the, again, Tinder does it in like full kilometer or mile increments, while Bumble does to tenths of mile or kilometers, that is, uh, that's a lot more information um, than, not a lot, that's maybe superlative, but that's more information than maybe you need to give out. Um, okay, Cupid does a great job of this, they do like 1, 5, 10, and 15 mile increments, at least last year when I was looking into it, um, and so that's also great. It tells you, yeah, I can walk to this person to meet them tonight, or I could drive, or maybe I'd have to fly, <laughs> you know? So you kind of have like a, a general idea of how far it would take you to get to meet somebody without saying like they are right down the block from you or being able to spoof your location and triangulate where that person likely is in the city. On the, the user side, you can do things like don't connect to your Instagram. Um, and this one right here, the prevent real-time location sharing for reduction is something I, I really want to highlight. I like. I get excited about it, you might not, but. So, what here controls the disclosure of your information, of your, of your location? The client, yeah, the client. So it's the client on, and that, that client is usually your phone. And so, when we think about who has control of that, we can think about what is the actual device that we're using as an end user. So, Android, you either can 
disclose your, inf your location to an app or just not disclose it. On iPhone, you have gradients. You can say, only disclose this when I'm using the app, always disclose it even when it's running in the background, or don't disclose it at all to this application. And so you can start to think about, well, I feel more comfortable using these applications on my iPhone, and I'm only going to use these applications when I'm in transit. So it's harder to pinpoint exactly where I am, being able to say, this is where I live or this is where I work. So having control, once th this is why I get so excited, is because once you start doing threat modeling, you say, oh my goodness, I have control over this. So it gives you power as a user. And you say, I have control over this, and, these, and there are intentional decisions that I can make. There are intentional decisions that I can make that can affect my, the outcomes that I'm trying to, to achieve from a security standpoint. Great. So I'm going to wrap this up. So my love of threat modeling. Um, it helps builders build better. Uh, it helps defenders think uh, intentionally. So you know, whether it's a blue team or it's some type of kind of mixture uh, of defensive, offensive-minded folks, um, it helps you identify where are those risks going to be. As somebody who does mainly offensive work, love attack trees. I love doing DFDs and hypotheticals and saying, okay, I want to prioritize this type of attack over this type of attack. Um, and in the end, what is most important to me is it helps everyone make intentional decisions about data responsibility. And so once, you've, once you as a user do threat modeling on something that you're going to do, you have to, you, you become responsible saying, do I want to actually engage with this? Or if I want to engage with it, how will I engage, engage with it more responsibly? And as an application developer, once you have done threat modeling and continue to do it throughout your, as you iterate and, and build your application over time, and you refer back and you update and all of this, you take ownership of what you identify. If you're building a dating application and you go, well, this is going to disclose potentially where people live, are we okay with that? And if we're not okay with that, can we provide some type of gradient? So in the end, I want people to be, there, we all have different risk tolerances, and in the end, there's no one-size-fits-all security. But there is the ability to be a lot more intentional than we currently are. Um, yeah, and so I, these are the sources. Um, this right here is... I put all my slides that I give up on my GitHub. Um, and so you can get the sources there and um, also see a previous version. It's only changed slightly since then. And uh, I think I have two minutes. So I have two minutes, so maybe one short question, one long question or two short questions um, if anybody has them. Thank you, Isaiah. Yes. Thank you, Isaiah, for this great talk. I learned so much. I have two quick questions. Yes. One, uh, would you still recommend people use these apps? Do you use them yourself if it's not too much of a personal question? And do you think people are stay, still safe using these online um, dating apps? And the second question is actually not a question, it's a comment. Uh, there's a new show now on Netflix called You. Uh, it's like a romantic okay. psycho thriller. But I just want to recommend the first two episodes. They really showcase a lot of the consequences of digital stalking because oh, it's okay. a guy wow. who stalks yeah. a girl using like her online media profiles and her dating profiles. So it, it really showcases a lot of that. And it's not a tech show. It's not yeah. like a Mr. Robot show. It's just helpful. So that's a show called You. But Great. I'd love to hear your answer to my question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. thank you for that. So yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll look into that. Um, and I think, you know, you said it's not a tech show. But I, 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 I do think that like, you know, anything today, the human experience is a tech experience. And so I think that's, that's probably great at demonstrating that. So the question is, um, do I use these? Um, and do I still feel that it's safe? Um, the answer to, to that is, yes, I use social media and I have used dating applications. Um, and I'm happy to talk about my experience with those on a more personal, non-recorded, intimate level with anybody. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Um, do I think it's, it's safe? Um, like I said, I think it's a gradient. I think it's uh, when I engage with any type of social media application, I'm very aware, whether it's Instagram, what am I taking a picture of? Am I delaying posting that picture if I don't want folks to know where I am specifically at that time? Or do I not care? So it takes a lot of thought and it can be kind of exhausting, but, and, I, and I'm very privileged in the sense that I do this for a living. 
Like, imagine folks who don't do this for a living. Like, it's not even comprehensible. So, the, I think that there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the app developer side to make it so that it can be, um, that it can be more intrinsic. You know, like we heard this morning, making kind of sec things secure by default and then letting people roll that back, you know, from a developer side, but I think that same thing goes for, for building social, social connected applications. Um, so I, that might be kind of a, a bit of a roundabout answer, and I, I, I do think that it is safer than it has been. I think there's a long way to go, and I think there are steps that we can take individually to low, depending on our risk appetite, to engage with these platforms. Thank you. Thank you.